Jimmy, my friend. Hello, my friend. What a way to open up the show by getting your uh, your stage name incorrect. Hey, man, we took a couple a week break between season two and season three, but uh, we're back, and my background's different. Little... Yeah, you're you're still on vacation. I see that you're still in Venezuela. Yeah, I'm here. As you can see, I'm just in the woods right now. I'm in deep in I'm deep in the forest. This is actually just like sun peeking through all of the uh, foliage. It's, yeah, it's weird because it does look like there is maybe some like drywall on your left, or like uh, there's something that is like not forest. Well, there's but... like a hut. There's like a hut where I'm staying. Is like it behind it. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's weird how it is. Like you can just see it's like where those two different huts begin, and this is the walkway behind me. So for sure, yeah. yeah. So. Uh... Tell me all about Venezuela. Have you have you encountered? So I just watched a rat. Oh, 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 oh. wait a minute. Oh. <laughs> Wool has been pulled over my eyes. Uh, it's like Looney Tunes. It's like it's like a fake tunnel on the yeah. on the wall. Wouldn't it be funny um, if I just like ran backwards? <laughs> <laughs> we did take we did take a nice little break. Um, and yeah. I feel rejuvenated. How uh, how was your trip? It was good, man. It was nice to see some friends and uh, just be somewhere that wasn't uh, here. Just change of pace. I kind of wish we we were planning on taking a two week break, but we ended up taking a three week break, which is good because um, you know it was the Fourth of July, so we might as well. It's a holiday. Yeah, yeah, it just it felt um, like we would have been fine if we took two weeks off, but I think. I think everybody has stuff going on so i don't think anybody was really missing an episode and now we are back firing on all cylinders and we mm -hmm. were working on some stuff behind the scenes too um but the show is back i'm very excited uh we are talking about yeah independent films yeah season, season. three is a good one man i mean it's this is what we're this is what we designed this podcast for i mean to talk about films and help us become better film makers and everything we do is pretty much independent. So, Hey, let's devote a whole season. Yeah. And I would love to get, uh, I'd love to get people involved in the sense that the, the films for this season right now are pre-selected mm -hmm. and they are pre-selected based on my intensive research of Googling best indie films of the 2010s and just pulling based on description. I did want to get some diversity in there because I realize that we've done two seasons of uh, white guy directors and those movies are great and there's nothing wrong with liking those movies. But um, especially with indie filmmakers, I feel like now there is a lot more opportunity for different kinds of people to get into yeah. the, uh, to get into the medium. Mm -hmm. And so I did want to make sure that we got some people of color and some women directors and, and just kind of get some different viewpoints and even genres, you know, uh, I'm a horror guy and yeah. We've done horror, we've done drama, but like I wanted to get some comedy in there and some, you know, just different things that we maybe not have covered yet. Yeah, definitely, man. Change it up a little bit is always good for everybody, for sure. So my request for our audience is that, um, you know, as I said, the, the films are pre-selected here, but I would love to hear from you guys in terms of what your favorite indie films are, um, things we may have missed, uh, things that we aren't covering this season, but... Hey, if we have fun doing this season, you know, I think we're maybe going to go back to director specific season for maybe season four, but maybe we'll do, maybe we'll come right back around and do a second independent season after that, you know? So definitely let us know in the comments, you know, what your favorite independent yeah. filmmakers are and, and films and, and give us some recommendations because we, we'd love to interact with that. Yeah. And I mean, if something comes down the pipe, you know, I mean, I know a couple of them are like really set in stone. Uh, cause we'll be having a couple guests on potentially if, if everything goes all right. But I mean, Hey, if we get a nice email and says, Hey, you know, we just worked on this film we'd really like for you guys to go over, Hey, we might be able to fit it in. So don't just feel like, cause this season's done. If you have something that you're working on or that you worked on, it's out, you know, let us know, send us an email. You can yeah, send us, send us your movie. Yeah. Um, for sure. That's where we are. That is a door that will never close uh, for Lomo. And whether mm -hmm. it's something for the podcast or whether it's something that we could help you potentially with in, yeah. some, so, in some kind of collaboration, um, we want to network. Definitely, so, 100%. Um, I think that's enough shop. I do want to say that Aaron is grumpy today, uh, or Mo is grumpy today, because he got his second vaccination, which is not enough of a reason to be grumpy. It went fine. 
didn't I, it was baby shit and I, I was like so scared and it was baby shit um but i did pull like a muscle in my neck and upper back last mm-hmm. week and i thought i slept on it wrong and it just hasn't gone away and yeah. i everything sucks it hurts i'm using a heating pad very often um and i need to hydrate because of this vaccine because i really don't want to feel like i got hit by a truck tomorrow but i feel like i'm in a brain fog and i was like you know what i need to feel less terrible a big old red bull so <laughs> mo is like on Mo is on Klonopin and Red Bull right now, so it's gonna be a fun, uh, fun episode. Um, I'm not a doctor, so nobody take this advice, but I'm giving it to Aaron though. The one thing that got me through it was, um, like Tylenol or not Tylenol, ibuprofen. I'm gonna have to text my mom and see what she said <laughs> before I kill you. So, okay, what I what I heard, yeah, what I heard was don't take ibuprofen. But here's the problem: I am taking 800 milligrams of ibuprofen every six hours for this back thing. I think it and was. I don't plan on stopping that. Anyways, I took. I know what I did take. It was sinus tablets, like sinus pill, like medication. Oh, interesting. And I never, I never got sick, like from it really. I'm hoping I'm just tired. The first shot did make me a little bit. Uh, I felt like at, I got it at like in the morning. By the end of that day, I was like, "Man, I just kind of feel like tired and hot." And it wasn't bad. Like by the by the next day, I was fine. But I did feel just kind of like fluey, mm-hmm. like a little sore, a little tired, a little hot. Um, so I'm expecting that, and yeah. I have just stocked the fridge with Powerade. Smart. Um, and I got yeah. plenty of movies to watch. There you so. Go. And speaking about That's movies, it. let's talk about uh, yes. let's actually talk about the movie that we watched for this podcast, uh, episode one of season three. This was Aaron's pick, so I mean, most it, of these are your pick. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, I got so a you kind of gave me you kind of gave me free reign this season. We yep. did things a little bit different because uh, instead of picking directors, we picked these independent films, and I just I had a list of about fifty movies, and I just read synopsises and synopsis synopsises. And just tried to pick 10 different movies, essentially. Yeah. Um, and we had initially had a different movie slated for this week, but I will, we'll talk about that later. Um, I wanted to start off on a what I perceived would be a high note, and we'll get into this. Um, so I picked a movie that I had seen. Now, I've not seen this film, but I had seen it come up on Netflix a bunch when it was on Netflix. And I knew that it was from the director of The Green Room, um, Jeremy Saulnier. And this film is Blue Ruin. It is from 2013. It is a uh, revenge thriller. And um, that's about all I knew about it, aside from the fact that it was largely crowdfunded. Um, he had made a movie previous to this called Murder Party, which I recommend. I enjoy a lot. It's like a horror comedy. And I had no idea that he directed that until I was doing some research for this. But um, for this movie, this is very interesting. He he and the, the lead in this film, Macon Blair... They grew up wanting to make movies together, and they made Murder Party, and it was, like, well-received critically, but, you know, didn't make a lot of money or anything. It was an independent feature. And so they said, you know what? If we don't get to chase this dream of making movies for the rest of our lives, let's just make one more to go out on. That's, like, that's what we want to do. And fortunately, it worked out, because Blue Ruin did so well that he has gone on to make... uh, make green room and and i believe macon blair is actually directing the toxic avenger remake yeah that's yeah out. it's so, actually what i just looked like when i was doing my little research before this that was something that i thought i was like oh that's cool that's neat so yeah, so it seems it seems like it worked out for him which yeah. uh, which i'm glad um but it's cool to see and and i also read that he was very hesitant about doing the crowdfunding because he felt uncomfortable taking money from people which is something you and i've talked about yeah i was like that's like like, that's very like where i think that's like you're like one of your not so much me that's one of your biggest hang-ups in doing this is like actually like getting people to like donate and stuff where i feel like it's almost a must yeah well and i i agree i think it's not as much a hang-up as it is just like making sure that like there's a lot of especially after the last year with people like losing their jobs and stuff, there's a lot of places people can give their money. So like, I feel like not as inclined to ask other people for money unless I'm able to really give them something back for it. And so that is just kind of the 
the hurdle I'm getting over is just knowing that this short film that we're going into filming, um, and I do think we're this is this is on topic. I think because my what I want to do for this season is is really just pull away what these independent filmmakers did yeah. to make their to make their movies, what we can learn from that. Um, so for me, it is just we're going into filming this short film this summer, and I want to make sure that it is, uh, you know, both for the people that happen to let us use locations and give their time to us. And just for us, because it's important to us, I want to make sure it's the best uh, product. Product's a bad word, but the best piece of media, the best story we can tell, you know? Yeah. So, and that was my big pull away from this. So let's talk about Blue Ruin, because one of the first things I noticed right away was like, this is not a cheap looking movie. No. Um, and relatively speaking, it is. it was a cheap film to make. And when I say that, that cheap. It's like four hundred thousand yeah, dollars, but four hundred is cheap. Yep, it's cheap for it's not it's not a major studio release. It's not like they spent over a mil. Um, some of that was their life savings, was Saulnier's life savings and and Blair's, and then the rest was crowdfunded. Um, but this is a movie with it looks like a real movie. It it is a real movie, but it's like when you think independent feature, this looks like a real movie, and I think that the big takeaway that I had was like their budget. This is going to maybe sound obvious, but I think like your budget can only take you so far. You could have the best equipment in the world, but if you don't have a vision and if you don't have like um, the eye for the shots you want, and if you haven't studied film and not even filmmaking, but like the idea that I, I was just thinking about this last night, because on the weekends I watched so many movies. I was like, you really, for me, I feel like a sponge and I watch three to six movies a weekend and I just absorb the good and the bad and all of it to try to kind of figure out what I'm doing and what I want to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do the same thing when I watch stuff. Yeah. You have to. I think you could, yeah, I think you could tell with this movie that they really had that because it, it it was the shot. The cinematography was great. Mm -hmm. Um, the most notable thing for me when I was thinking about the writing of this is, the dialogue would fit on less than 20 pages, probably, probably 15 pages. Yeah. It's something that kind of surprised me when we first started watching it. It was like without, so minus the interaction between Dwight and the police officer there, we went a long time without like anything being said as far as like dialogue. I mean, there was like radio and kind of like ambient sounds and people talking or laughing or whatever that was. But as far as like actual like character to character dialogue was non-existent and it proves, it proves a very valid point that sometimes I think it's like, you don't always need dialogue. Like as far as you're no. like, because it was like traveling, you could tell by watching the story was progressing. You didn't need to have somebody like come in and like tell you a bunch of backstory until you kind of figured it out and you're like, okay, like I'm caught up. I'm ready to go. Let's see yeah. where this is going. I thought that was really well done. It's the number one rule they teach you in film school. And I struggled with this for a long time when I was taking my screenwriting class, but they say show don't tell. And this is the most perfect example I can think of is 15, at least probably like 15 minutes with no dialogue, but by showing Dwight going about his day, you can, pretty much immediately by his actions gather okay he's like a vagrant mm -hmm. he lives out of his car um you know and like even the di the dialogue they do use is minimal it reminded yeah. me actually a lot of john wick um not just in the sense that it's a revenge movie but in the sense that it is like the dialogue is sparse and it's necessary so like the police officer she doesn't give this a diatribe of exposition where she's like, we know your parents were murdered by Wade uh, Clandon or whatever. And, you know, we want to make, she just says, you know, I want to make sure you're safe when you find out about this. They're letting him out. Like it's very, it's very sparse. It just gives you what you need to know. And you pick up context clues. There's like a shot of a newspaper that says, you know, yeah. uh, the, the sky is getting out and you really, it lets, it doesn't treat the audience like they're stupid. It really lets you put the pieces together. Well, it makes you feel, and I think that's something a lot of films miss. And it, I mean, you don't really need it because most films that do this end up being successful. But the thing is, is like treating us more like we're from uh, this world and less like we're looking at it from like an outside, like above lens. And like, right. we're right there with them because it's like, 
oh, well, you should know who like Wade is. You should know who. And then throughout the story, you get to like play investigator, like put it all together in the story. And they don't spend a half hour at the beginning explaining why, like what his motivation is. We learn his motivation right. through. Right. And I think as far as storytelling, that's a huge point. Like, I don't want you to tell me 20 minutes how I should feel. I want to decide how I feel. And they did a really good job with that. Definitely. Um, the, the morals of the end of this film, so we'll fast forward, and obviously this is a spoiler show, so if you haven't watched the film, highly recommend it. Um, uh, highly recommend it. I, we'll talk about how we feel about the movie. I, I did like it. I do recommend it. Um, you can rent it. I don't think it's streaming anywhere right now, but it's for rent on Vudu and YouTube and mm-hmm. places like that. Um, but spoilers, the end of the film, Wade not Wade, excuse me, Dwight breaks into the Clandon household and is just waiting for them to get home. At this point, he's killed Wade, he's killed Teddy, who's Wade's brother, and he leaves them this voice message. And I thought this scene was so tense and so well done and, like, just made your skin crawl, not in a bad way, but just knowing that, like, these people are being watched. Yeah. Um, He's hiding behind a wall, and this family gets home, and they listen to their answering machine Mm -hmm. and he basically gives them a choice and he's like you you know your family killed two of mine because his parents were killed he says i've killed wade i killed teddy i've killed two of yours to me that makes us even but i really just want this to i really just want this to end and this dumb (laughs) the guys of their other brother this dumb like you know he's he's like he tried to get his sister out so the whole thing is his car is registered to his sister's house that's how they found him they go to his sister's house he gets them out in time but he's trying to figure out like is my sister going to be safe essentially and this guy lets it slip while they're listening to this message because he's so upset that he's like we're going like he's like that's why we're going to pittsburgh you know because they want to go kill his sister and that's when he knows like there's you know his sister's not safe and so he comes out from behind the wall and mercs carl and uh wings one of the girls and this is like he has this moral dilemma where he talks to them and just says like i don't want to kill you and i've like wrestled with it in my head Mm -hmm. how am i supposed to know that you're not going to go after my sister and her kids especially at this point well you you can see that like when he's hiding behind the wall and we actually get to see his point of no return you know right at the end of the movie i mean there's probably a couple more throughout it but you know, he has the gun on Carl's head, like, at the whole time. Like, he could have easily yeah. killed him at any point, but then he kind of lowers it, and he thinks to himself, he's like, okay, I don't need to do this. We're probably good. You know, he's, like, he's not a killer. He has no intention of killing people. He just wants to make things right, and he wants to make sure his sister's fine. And I think at a true level, any of us can feel that way as far as, like, family goes. And as soon as he yells that he's going there, he's like, all right, I'm done. Boom. And just kills him. And it's crazy watching that. Yeah. I like this, the more that we talk about it, because it, there is actually a lot for as it's a very straightforward movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I like that about it. It's like 90 minutes. There's, um, there's like, you know, there's like a couple, I wouldn't call them twists, but there's like some unpredictable moments, but overall it's like, you get the, it's not complicated. It's not hard to follow. No. Um, you find out that uh, Dwight's Dwight's father and Wade's mother had an affair. And that's why this whole thing happened. That's why Dwight's parents were killed. And you find out that his mother wasn't supposed to be there, but she was. And so she got wrapped up in it. And um, it's this idea of like these, this, these two warring families, none, neither, none of them are like, really it's not that they don't have stake in it but it's the idea that like the people before them are the ones that committed the yeah it's a cause and effect butterfly effect type thing right so they're 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 stuck in this world of feeling you know like they have to avenge somebody instead of instead of letting it go and and i think that that's like a really interesting um world to be in and you find out that uh dwight has a half brother william Mm -hmm. who shows up and um shoots Dwight but even then and Dwight is the protagonist and I don't know how you're supposed to feel about anybody really I think this movie to me it feels more like I almost feel for everybody because I think that I don't think that anyone is in the wrong about how they feel about the other party it's just that they are in an ugly situation Mm. 
Um, but I love William. William comes in with a gun and he shoots Dwight in the side while Dwight, after Dwight kills Carl and he's holding up the girls, he shoots Dwight in the side. Even that moment to me, it feels necessary. And William is even like, I don't want to do this. Like immediately after he shoots Dwight, he's like, they're, they're like, kill him. Like you have to kill him or he's going to kill your family. And he's like, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't have any, I, I'm just here trying to like stop this from happening essentially. Yep. And, uh, and William is like, or not William, uh, Dwight is like, oh, I think you did your job. He knows that he's probably going to bleed out, you know, if something worse doesn't happen. And so he just tells him to get out of there. He's like, leave the gun. My car is up the road. You know, at the movie ends with him saying keys are in the car. Uh, he he wants his half-brother, this person he has no relationship with, to basically be able to just get out of this situation. Because that's yeah. all he wants. Mm -hmm. You know, it's too late for him. But it's not too late for William. And he doesn't like harbor any bad feelings against William for shooting him. You know, he, he understands that everyone's motivations in this, it's just really fascinating. The character relationships in this are really fascinating. Yeah. I'd agree too. I think as far as this like straightforward, you said it earlier, you know, this is a very straightforward movie. And I think one way they could have ruined this is if we back to our earlier points, if they Blue told us ruined this, if they uh if they actually told us more about this like dynamic and we didn't piece it together, I think if you knew like the story, like this movie would have got very boring really quickly. So as I think I, I think is the problem with like straightforward movies. The more you tell, the less interesting it is. But like you have to pick up the pieces as the movie goes to right. keep uh, your viewer interested. So I think if they would have told us more, it could have been a very like bad movie, a very like uninteresting kind of straightforward, just run-to-the-mill movie, but it wasn't. I'm not saying that. It just, like, they could have went a different direction and completely ruined it, I think, yeah. anyways. And I, I, what I love about this is that it is small, in the sense that it is, like, small scope. Mm -hmm. um, there are five Clandon siblings, and three of them only show up at the end of the movie. So yeah. It's like not really hard to to put together who's who. Mm -hmm. Um there's there's White and his sister, and then there is William. And it's it's very small scope. Like it, it's these characters, you spend just enough time with them to get the gist of who they are. Um, but it's not like there's a hundred characters to keep track of. It it makes me feel good about what we're shooting this summer because my script has five characters in it, you know? Um, and this idea that a movie doesn't necessarily have to have subplot, doesn't necessarily have to have, you know, like, like we never check back up on Sam and the kids. And that's okay, though. It doesn't feel incomplete or inconclusive. It just feels like it's not the story we're telling. And I think if this was, like, a different movie and a bigger movie with a different director, there might this movie might be two hours. And it's like, oh, you spend an extra... 20 minutes with Sam and the kids wondering where they went after they left the house, you know, but well, you, you don't, don't need, need it. You don't this need movie, it. Like, that's, you don't need it. It's just bare it bones. It gives you exactly what you need. Um, it's very efficient. I would say just in general reactions. Uh, I would say that I like this movie. I would say that it's probably a mood movie. Like it's probably something that I wouldn't just throw on. Um, probably something I'd want to be in the mood for. But uh, props for being as quick as it is. I think it's well paced. Mm -hmm. um, I never checked. I never checked the time on it. It's only ninety minutes. Um, I think that there are a couple moments where how quiet it is and how dialogueless it is. You do. It is kind of easy to be like, all right, like where's this going? What's next? What's the next thing? But that would be my only maybe ding against it. Otherwise, I mean, I just think it is expertly crafted, especially for like a sophomore feature. Um, and there's a lot to, to be learned from, from a movie like this. Um, I don't know. It, it reminds me of, it reminds me of like an independent art house version of John Wick or like an exploitation version of John Wick. It, it kind of harkens back to these grindhouse movies. Um, it's not over the top. I was expecting it to be really over the top violent. You hear revenge thriller these days 
and it's very easy to think rape and revenge, which is its own sub genre of horror movie. Um, and this is a movie where you don't even get that. Not only is there like not rape in it, but it's like, you know, his parents get killed. There's not even a flashback to it. No. Like, there's not even just, it just shows you and tells you this is what's happening and lets you go. I think um, as far as like a takeaway for me, like when we go ahead and talk about making our own films and everything, it's, it's just so, it's so critical. I think, especially now in today's society and how people's minds work is you have to keep them invested the whole like way through. You can't just like, you know, tell everybody like, this is the world. These are your characters. This is the motivation. Welcome to our movie. I think right. that is like, that is film making past. There's a lot of movies that do it well, but I think now if you're making a film, you need to like have these little bits of like, just keep them like a carrot just at the end and then bring it all yes. together, bring it all together. Because Expo I think exposition is the number one uh, mistake that filmmakers make now, like current mm -hmm. filmmakers is just feeling like they have to be very upfront with telling the audience what's going on. And this is a perfect example of like, you parse it out little bits and it's never boring. It's never some character talking. Of, like I said, there's never a character that's just having a long conversation about like, Oh, this is this thing that happened. Like you, you know, you remember how it felt that day when mom and dad were murdered by Wade. Like there's nothing like that. You know, mm -hmm. it, it just, it gives you little pieces that you put together as time goes on and it, it keeps you invested. Yeah. And who knows how much of that was done, like in editing, like who knows, like if that was really their true intention, like it's, I'd love to know if like when they were filming, like how much did they cut out? Like what was left on the cutting, uh, quote unquote, cutting room floor. Right. Like, I want to know that's one of these things with these movies that like you said, it could have easily been, you know, two hour plus with a different, you know, director. I'm glad it's not. We've talked about in previous seasons, how like upset I get when movies are longer than they need to be. Um, but I would, I would really like to get some inside scoop to see like what was taken out or see some scenes that like weren't in here and what was the creative decision to make it, you know, what is an hour and 36 minutes, I think is what it was. Yep. I love the scene too, just to, to circle back real quick. Like I mentioned how tense the standoff at the end of the film is. I also love the scene where he lets Teddy out of the trunk and it's like, two people on the screen mm -hmm. you know it's just a back and forth somebody with a gun somebody stuck in the trunk and the dialogue is still sparse but it's good and it's just it's like what you need to know but it's also got these really nice little moments where teddy is it seems like that family is maybe used to crime or used to um have running in trouble with the law so he's got these little isms like when he says you know he's like I don't think Wade hurt your parents. And Dwight's like, well, I think they did. And he's like, all right, well, you're the one with the gun. The one with the gun has the tr tells the truth, you know? What else do you want me to say? I'm not going to argue with you. Like, I love that. His attitude, that character, um, just another really good tense scene between yeah. two people. And it goes to show, like, how little frills you need to put on something in order to make it tense. It's just a very real moment. Speaking you know? about that scene, though, one of the coolest moments though is when teddy gets shot from distance and his head like snaps and you like yeah. see a p i thought that was really well done like as far as an independent film's concerned like that you know those are like those are the tells in a movie it's not the dialogue scenes it's not anything else sometimes you can tell with like a graininess of a camera or like the quality right. but um those are usually the tells in an independent film is when you have to like you know the arrow scene in particular with that arrow in uh, yes. Dwight's leg and he's trying to perform surgery on himself, which is absolutely crazy, you know, and like having yeah. that, what I assume is a prosthetic and that was made was very r realistic. I think his acting during that was well done. It was very, very believable. And, uh, the description, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, and then I just want to circle back. And then, I mean, obviously the culmination of seeing Teddy's like bottom jaw get like shot out. And then the funniest yeah. part is he's like, well, that's what bullets do. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's his friend, Ben, the gun guy. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, that's a fun part. Um, I think that 
so it's interesting. Uh, the description for this movie said, use the word brutal. And that's like a common thing with revenge movies. And so I went into this expecting it to be a lot more brutal than it actually is. And what I would say is the violence that does happen, because it is so few and far between, it hits you a lot harder. It's, yeah. a, it's a lot more effective. So like, you know, seeing, having not really anything too brutal happen, he he does kill Wade uh, in a kind of a brutal way, but it's not over the top gory or anything. But it's like that happens, then there's maybe 20 minutes go by, and then it's the arrow scene. Yeah. And having him pull that out of his leg. Like, really effective based on just how they use the violence um, to realistically. And that is the difference between a movie like this and John Wick. And I love John Wick, so this is not um, down that movie at all. But John Wick is a an unrealistic spectacle action, you know, over the top. This is totally down to earth, totally, almost totally realistic. Um, even the way people react. I loved decisions they made and how they reacted when he first tells his sister that he killed Wade uh, and she does start and when she finds out her kids are in are in danger she changes her tune a little bit but I love this detail any other movie would have been this cliche the script writes itself where he says I killed Wade and she's like oh, I can't believe like how could you I can't believe you would do that she she reacts as like I'm good I'm glad I hope you suffered like, that is that was such a real moment uh, and I just love stuff like that. I mean, it felt like the characters made realistic decisions. Yeah, the that's... Jess was watching the movie with me. We were watching him with the arrow in his leg. And I was like, don't pull it out. Break it off. And, and then it cuts to him. And that's what he's doing. And then he's going to get stuff to clean it up. And I'm like, okay, finally, somebody who's not like making dumb decisions, you know? I think a lot of films now, it's, it, like at least for me, like my, like my main goal as a film maker moving forward with the films that I put my name on I want them to be realistic to the sense of like what would happen obviously the world rules would change as far as like what could happen but it's like as a person like you're going to make a decision like just because you're like in a movie like your decisions like I think there's so many times where you're just like sitting there watching a movie and you're like well, who would do this who for a movie like this it is just very refreshing you see real characters making real decisions you 100%. know percent um, so I, I don't know about you. I would definitely, I, I liked this movie and my only real hang up was just, I was like, oh, like, I think I'd have to be in the mood to watch this again. But I got to say, even the more that we talk about it, the more I really, really appreciated yeah, this I, movie and liked it. I think, you know, it's, is it like, is it a top 10 film for me that I've ever watched? No. Is it a movie that right. I'll recommend to anybody? Yeah, it was a good watch. I enjoyed it. Extremely, I had Extremely, extremely solid. Yeah. Um, and, and what I would say too is, I'd recommend Murder Party. I'd recommend Green Room, which came after this. Yeah, I'd like to rewatch. Um, but that would be the other lesson I would take: is Murder Party is so tonally different than this that I think it's never too late to um, switch directions or switch genres and try something new. And then I and I really think that based on how well this did and, and kind of how the things that this movie shares with Green Room, um, I think that it is there's always time to find your footing. Yeah. And there's always time to figure out like kind of what your direction is. And uh, yeah, just just a really, really strong second feature from a director. Enough of that. That was uh, it felt feels great, buddy, to be back recording yeah, it does, uh, man. At the movies. And so let me pull up our schedule for next week. Let everybody know what we're watching. Important note um, for this week, though, before our schedule for next week, make sure that uh we are watching the amusement park streaming on Shutter. Uh, our podcast after the movies will be out with that. So if you want to watch that before, just go ahead and watch that. That'll be coming out on Thursday. Yes, uh, we are going to be watching. Um, what do we want to watch next week? We got we got options. I mean, we haven't decided, predetermined. Let me ask you: Do you feel like watching? I'll let you pick. You feel like watching a comedy? documentary or the one that you picked i don't know anything about it so i can't even give you any let's do let's do a comedy to kind of break it up a little bit i think a comedy okay. would be nice let's do we're gonna watch computer chess next okay. week nice. um directed by andrew 
Bujowski. Um, again, another film, unfortunately, because of the nature of these features being independent, a lot of this season you're probably going to have to rent. Um, but what I'll say is most of these films can be rented on YouTube or Vudu or a similar channel for $2.99. Three ninety nine. Yeah. Um, so hopefully it, it shouldn't be too expensive. Um, but that will be next week's feature. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm very excited. Something different. Looking forward to this season, man. Looking forward to it. Definitely. And we got some. We got some. Uh, I do believe without without sh- pulling the the trigger too fast. I do believe that we have some guests lined up, and I believe that we have some uh, some local features planned for this season. And if I'm not mistaken, we have three of those. So it's going nice. to be very exciting to sprinkle those throughout. Nice, so. nice, nice. And as always, you can contact us by DMing us on Twitter at Lomo Media or just uh, contact Lomo Media at gmail.com so if you have any. Yes, and... Uh, one last note, if you'd like to watch the films with us this season, we would love to discuss them with you as we are watching them in real time. Uh, you can join our Patreon and our Discord for just $3 a month, less than a cup of coffee. Um, gets you access to the Discord. You can hang out, uh, ask us questions, whatever you want to do. But we do at least two watch parties a week. Yep. Um, and we watch the movies for at the movies, after the movies, we sync up. We would love to watch these with you and you can kind of get our thoughts in real time and, and even maybe bring up some points that we wouldn't have thought of on the episode. So yeah, we hope to see you there. That's, that's all I got, man. Ready. Thank you guys so much for watching at the movies. It feels great to be back and we hope you'll join us for the rest of the season. It's going to be a good one. I can feel it. So we'll see you on Thursday with after the movies, the amusement park. <laughs>